Recently, I spoke to two experts about the situation in Libya. For over 10 years, the people have been suffering from cycles of conflict and political instability. Our experts will go in depth about the situation. Welcome, everyone. Today, we'll be talking about Libya with Stephanie Williams. She's the former special advisor to the Secretary General of the United Nations and the former deputy special representative of the Secretary General political and the acting special representative of the Secretary General in Libya. Welcome, Stephanie. Thanks, Andrew. It's great to be here. We would love for you to talk to us today about how you characterize the fragility in Libya, the instability, and how it uniquely manifests itself in that country. I think one of the uh, ongoing uh, factors that has contributed to uh, Libya's uh, fragility and the inability of, of um, you know, Libya to move forward to a state of stability and prosperity is um, the lack of um, implementation of uh, DDR. That's, you know, a demobilization, disarmament, and reintegration of armed groups, which is really something that should have uh, happened uh, in the 2012 and 2013 period uh, following uh, the fall of uh, Mr. Uh, Gaddafi's regime. And, you know, as we know, during, during the uprising against Mr. Gaddafi, uh, there was the establishment of, you know, literally, you know, hundreds of armed groups. Um, and at, uh, you know, following the downfall of the regime, um, instead of, uh, a serious effort towards DDR and security sector reform, what we saw was, you know, the tendency of the Libyan authorities to, to really engage in the sort of payoff of uh, many of uh, these armed groups. Uh, and soon what you saw was as the state was trying to, uh, you know, establish itself, the armed groups sort of turned the tables on them. And uh, what emerged, and this is throughout the country, this is not isolated to one, one geographic area in the country, what you've seen now is the, uh, the emergence of, you know, where, whereas in Lebanon, you, you know, Hezbollah is, is the state within the non-state. In Libya, you have multiple armed groups who are the mini states within the vast uh, non-state who, uh, who engage in extortion and, and threats and for whom perpetuation of the conflict uh, is, um, is something that they, they strive for um, because you know, that's the way they sustain themselves in combination now with a post 2011 ruling class, which includes them, the business elite and the political elite. And none of these um, constituencies have any interest in seeing the country actually move forward progressively uh, towards, um, you know, a democratically elected uh, uh, government. And what's their relation uh, with with the political class? These armed groups. Well, look, it's quite a symbi symbiotic uh, relationship uh, now, um, and you can see it in the. Uh, continuing desire for power sharing arrangements because let's let's face it who benefits from power sharing relation uh, power sharing arrangements and who doesn't benefit so those who are already within uh, within the ruling circles uh, can use um, these uh, exercises where which are non-democratic uh, where you are basically just rearranging the chairs uh, or you are in some kind of, uh, you know, redistributive manner, bringing more people, you know, into uh, the circle. So the armed groups benefit because they put pressure on the political actors who then somehow have to mollify, you know, the, the, arm, the armed groups, whether it is through promises of, you know, uh, further payments or in fact giving them more authorities and in fact giving them a, a solid place at the table. Um, and, and then the political actors and, and the business elite similarly, uh, you know, sort of delight in, in the patronage game because they can bring in, you know, their associates into the government, into powerful 
positions. Um, so who doesn't benefit, of course, are the you know, 2.8 million Libyans who registered to vote and who have the you know, inherent right to democratically elect those who, who represent them. And against this sort of atomized picture of security that you paint and, and the most basic element of a state, the, the, the monopoly on security, what is the governance structure that we see? We still have, as I understand, a divided government. It's complicated in Libya. And one of the things that makes um, forging peace in, in Libya quite um, unique, uh, uh, particularly with in, in comparison with some of its neighbors is the fact that Libya is a rentier economy. It's a one crop state entire, you know, the revenues of the state derive from, from one resource basically. And that's, that's oil. Uh, and something like 80% of Libya's working population derives its salary from the state. So uh, what you have, you know, you had sort of uh, Mr. Gaddafi's, you know, very unique <laughs> and, often brutal a uh, style of governance, um, but it was sort of, you know, it could be chaotic in its own way, although you could argue he had monopoly of, uh, over the use of force. Um, but uh, what we have seen uh, since then is um, an overly centralized model. Uh, and, and, and in the grinding conflict that has characterized Libya since 2011, you've seen uh, a terrible deterioration of basic infrastructure, you know, water treatment plants, uh, elect electricity grids, uh, and so that the, you know, the average Libyan has seen their um, way of life um, deteriorate markedly uh, from, from the, the, the previous era. Uh, and then on, on top of that, you have this, uh, this uh, huge bureaucracy. <laughs> I mean, something like more than 900 people work in the prime minister's office. Right. What, what do they all do? I mean, nobody, nobody really knows. They are all taking a, a, you know, a, a salary from the state. They have hundreds of embassies overseas. And they, so, you know, they, they, they just, they drain the resources of the state. It's overly centralized. This in a country which is geographically huge, three times the size of France, where, where I live now. Uh, and you have municipalities that are a thousand kilometers from the capital that are, you know, that are under-resourced. Uh, and so this, um, you know, this builds into this resentment towards the center. This is one of the primary drivers, you know, of the conflict. Although there is a law on the books, uh, Law 59 on decentralization has never been implemented because the ruling class isn't interested in this. So what does the picture for reconciliation and transitional justice look like and, and accountability for these, these bad actors? So far, the, the, the lack of uh, amendment, let's say, of... Uh, the transitional justice law, which was passed in uh, 2013, let alone any implementation of transitional justice ha is again, contributes to a feeling of insecurity and instability. It's hard to see how one moves so swiftly to national recon reconciliation, which let's face it, for many people just means compensation. So compensation without accountability I think only gets you, you know, uh, so far, there are many people who just want to lift the carpet and, you know, sweep under the carpet, you know, all of the abuses and there have been, it's, it's an epidemic of impunity in Libya with uh, the commission of, um, you know, terrible crimes, uh, crimes amounting to, to, to war crimes and forced disappearances rape and other types of, you know, sexual violence. Of course, the, uh, the terrible abuses that have been committed against uh, the, the migrants uh, uh, and foreign population in, in Libya, which have been well documented uh, by the United Nations. So this um, lack of ability is this kind of, uh, sorry, this lack of accountability is this kind of, it's a uh, open wound. Uh, uh, for Libyans. And I think, um, you know, how this project moves forward and it must move forward in tandem, you know, with the political process 
uh, will be uh, very important. So what has the role been of, of internationals, both the UN and other international actors within in Libya? Well, it's very much, I would say, a mixed record with regard to the international community's um, engagement on the Libyan file. So, uh, of course, you know, you've had a United Nations, a political mission. You've had, you know, United Nations agencies on the ground uh, since you know, 2011 through thick and thin through all of these conflicts, you've certainly had, you know, USAID, the European Union, um, many member states engaged in bilateral assistance, you know, all of this helps particularly, you know, for those actors who are most marginalized, and that's your, you know, uh, your civil, your civil society activists, political parties, human rights activists, you know, those who are, you know, not within the circle of the uh, ruling elite. At the same time, you've seen a lot of negative uh, foreign uh, interference in the country, of course, in the form directly of supplying of, you know, uh, weapons and uh, systems, armed systems uh, to uh, to Libyan actors, uh, the proliferation of, you know, foreign mercenaries, all of this, of course, in direct contravention of the UN arms embargo. And in addition, of course, you've had this, you know, this insidious relationship between, I would say, foreign intelligence services and Libyan political and military actors, all of it sort of under the surface of very seamy and non, non-transparent, which you know, does make it very difficult for the UN mediator you know, sort of the UN to run uh, a a more uh, transparent uh, uh, peace process in the country. And of course, you know, let's, you know, not only are they in terms of the arms and the mercenaries uh, contravening the arms embargo, they're also, you know, uh, contravening the you, the Libyan ceasefire agreement, which uh, the UN facilitated the signing of on October 23rd, 2020, which explicitly calls for the departure of mercenaries and foreign forces uh, from Libyan soil. So um, this all gets to, you know, where's, you know, what what role can the international, you know, community play? Of course, we, we established uh, the United Nations along with uh, then Chancellor Merkel established the Berlin process in 2019 and 2020. And I do believe that that process is still quite relevant and needed in Libya because I don't see that the UN Security Council um, is necessarily going to come uh, together and speak with one genuine voice and to use the leverage of the of the council uh, on uh, on the Libyan actors as needed so that you need this broader you know, international uh, process so that you at least have some consensus and then a mechanism through the international working groups to engage on the, on the various Libyan tracks where the political, economic, security, military, and the all important, you know, international humanitarian law and human rights track. The last question I have for you as the new special representative of the Secretary General takes up office, Mr. Abdullah Batili, from your time, if you could speak to what the best way forward uh, might be in the face of all of this, um, what, what, can, what can be done? I think most importantly, um, a, 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 a mechanism to, distri- to distribute the resources. And we know that, that the access to the resources is one of the uh, drivers of the conflict. So this is very good. And so I think that the constitutional project needs to be uh, picked up swiftly and pushed and pushed towards a conclusion so that you can, you know, uh, get back to, um, you know, the electoral project, which is what most Libyans want. Uh, I think that, you know, just uh, another power sharing arrangement, while, you know, I'm sure there are many who just want that. uh, And certainly that's what the political class wants wants everyone to do because, you know, the more you just redistribute the cake, um, you know, they're still at the table. If there are elections, uh, you know, I think as one of our our, um, LPDF members, you know, famously declared turkeys don't vote for Christmas. So, you know, they are not, they don't want elections until the very end of this process. Um, But I think that, 
elections and having a having a process that takes you to elections is actually part of the 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 peace process in Libya. If you remove the specter of elections and then you don't have any means uh, to uh, kind of manage the oil revenues, um, they will the the ruling class will will quarrel over the executive forever. Right. Whether they're called turkeys or dinosaurs, you know, it's this zero sum, (laughs) this zero sum game, I think. And this positive power sharing sounds like it is what is needed uh, in large part. I I really thank you for walking us through that. It really was great. And and really thank you for your time, Stephanie. It really was great to see you.